King Hussein ascended to the Jordanian throne at the age of 16 and dedicated his life to building a peaceful and prosperous Jordan. His reign was far from simple. He faced multiple external wars, a civil war, assassination attempts, and diplomatic crises. Throughout these tumultuous years, he maintained one secret connection that would be made official only years later, his relationship with Israel. Hello, and welcome to Decision Points. This season, we will tell the story of important Israeli and Arab leaders and their contributions to Arab-Israeli relations over the last 70 years. My name is David Markovsky, the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow and Director of the Project on Arab-Israel Relations at the Washington Institute. And I'm excited to go on this journey through history with you. King Hussein was born in Amman in 1935, the eldest son of Crown Prince Talal and the grandson of King Abdullah I, the first king of modern Jordan. On July 20th, 1951, Hussein traveled with his grandfather to Jerusalem, then under Jordanian control, for Friday prayers at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. While praying, a Palestinian assassin opened fire on Abdullah and Hussein after hearing rumors that Abdullah was planning on signing a peace treaty with Israel. In Amman, capital of the Jordan, there is mourning in the palace and great sorrow in the hearts of the people. The king who made them a nation is no more. Talal, Hussein's father and Abdullah's eldest son, became king. Yet he was forced to abdicate only a year later due to his poor mental health. On August 11, 1952, a young Hussein was crowned king of Jordan. Hussein had inherited a Jordan rife with issues. The population was majority Palestinian after Jordan's annexation of the West Bank after the 1948 war. This annexation was only recognized by Britain and Pakistan. In 1963, Hussein sent a message to Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol saying that he wanted to restart secret meetings with Israelis. King Hussein's grandfather, Abdullah, had conducted secret meetings with Israelis, including two with Golda Meir in the months preceding Israeli independence. Jordan's clandestine ties with Israel had been on ice since the 1951 assassination of Abdullah. Hussein met with Yaakov Herzog, the director general of the Israeli prime minister's office, in the London home of King Hussein's physician, Emmanuel Herbert, 1963, starting a long lasting back channel. Hussein maintained relationships with several key Israeli leaders over the decades, including Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, and Yitzhak Shamir, in a continuous attempt to build Jordanian-Israeli peace with subsequent governments. In the years leading up to the Six-Day War, Levi Eshkol used the back channel to plead for Jordanian restraint in the brewing conflict, but Hussein did not listen and instead put his troops under the control of Egyptian commanders. Hussein believed his own public would not accept being kept out of the war. Yet the result was disastrous. Despite joining the attack, Hussein did not lose his connection with the Israelis. Hussein was not seeking the establishment of a Palestinian state in the West Bank, but rather the resumption of Jordanian sovereignty over the area. Jordan's participation in the 1973 war was minimal, sending only a brigade to assist the Syrians in the Golan Heights. But during the weeks leading up to the war, Hussein met with Golda Meir to warn her of the imminent attack of Egypt and Syria. This sparked suspicions of Hussein among the Arab leaders, but Meir did not heed his warnings. Israel and Jordan came close to a public acknowledgement of their ties with the framework for a London peace conference in 1987, but Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir objected, fearing it would create international pressure on Israel. It would be a fateful mistake for Israel. The Palestinians would no longer wait for Jordan or orders from the PLO in Tunis, leading to the first intifada or uprising. In 1988, July 1st, King Hussein announced that Jordan would relinquish all legal and administrative claims over the West Bank, except for the Muslim and Christian holy sites in Jerusalem. Despite his utter distrust of Yasser Arafat, Hussein would also recognize the PLO's claim to form the state of Palestine. In 1993, as Israel and the PLO moved closer to signing the Oslo Accords, King Hussein felt betrayed. 
He had not been consulted by the Palestinians or the Israelis. Yet the Hussein Rabin relationship was rock solid and it would flourish. If the Palestinians could go public with secret contacts, then so too the Israeli Jordanian relationship could now be made public as well. An official treaty with Israel would also put Jordan back in America's good graces after being isolated and experiencing aid cuts for supporting Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War of 1991. King Hussein viewed peace as a historic and religious duty. This is peace with dignity. This is peace with commitment. After three decades of covert efforts, on July 25th, 1994, Hussein and Rabin signed a declaration in Washington that officially terminated the state of war between the two countries. Further, in October of 1994, Rabin and Hussein met to finalize the agreement by setting a border. The actual peace treaty was held in what the Jordanians called Wadi Arava, or the Israelis called the Arava. Even after achieving an official and public peace, Hussein continued to push for regional peace. In 1998, while he was undergoing aggressive chemotherapy at the Mayo Clinic, President Clinton asked him to come to the Y River Peace Conference to try to break a stalemate in the talks. Thanks in part to his presence, the leaders were able to resolve their differences, and Hussein received great praise from President Clinton for making the effort despite his poor health. After 47 years on the throne, King Hussein succumbed to cancer on February 7th, 1999. While there have been ups and downs in the Israeli-Jordanian relationship since the treaty was signed, peace has endured for over 25 years. I was honored to speak to two people who I think are the most intimately aware of King Hussein's road to peace with Israel. One is Jordan's Prince Hassan. He's the former crown prince, and he's the brother of King Hussein. And I had a long conversation with him when I visited Amman in January 2020, just before the coronavirus. And I'm also equally pleased to be joined by Ephraim Halevi, the former director of the Mossad and Israel's principal negotiator for the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. Before delving into the specifics about King Hussein's journey dealing with Israel, we need to have a wide lens view of who is King Hussein, what makes him tick, and what was the secret to his success? Someone who was really a leading watcher of the king for decades, a real expert on Jordan, is my colleague, Robert Satloff, the director of the Washington Institute. How does King Hussein compare to his grandfather, King Abdullah, who he was kneeling next to when his grandfather was assassinated in 1951? David, there's a lovely almost storybook idea that King Hussein fulfilled the mission of his grandfather, that he was his grandfather's grandson in more than just a genetic sense. And some of that is accurate. He certainly admired and loved and learned a great deal from his grandfather. Very different people with very different attitudes of the world and conceptions of themselves. Abdullah was ambitious. Abdullah throughout his entire life was on the offense. For Abdullah, who grew up having had his legacy taken away from him, namely his family were the guardians of Mecca. They lost that to the Saudis. And so they had nothing. And yet through his life and through the force of his personality, he and his family went from nothing to something. They became kings of Arab monarchies in Iraq and in Jordan. And his discussions with Zionists, as much as everything else, was to see whether they would agree to find the realization of the Zionist dream under the umbrella of the Hashemite monarchy, where they could have a national home in Palestine under the protection of the Hashemites. Hussein was something else. Hussein grew up seeing tragedy. He grew up with the tragedy of his grandfather's murder. He grew up with the tragedy of his father's mental illness being forced from the throne. For Hussein, the collective lessons of these tragedies was defense, protection, save what you can. If it meant losing the West Bank to keep 
the Hashemite monarchy in the East Bank, a painful, terrible, horrible choice. It's what he did to preserve what he had. Peace with Israel for him was another way to preserve the Hashemite monarchy. We see King Hussein is really the father of modern Jordan. His grandfather might have literally established the country, but he's the one who navigated it for decades. And there were treacherous waters domestically and regionally. How does the Israel element fit into his ability to navigate these treacherous waters, both at home and abroad? Israel plays a very important role in how Hussein views the security of the Hashemite kingdom. There is a misconception that the Hashemite kingdom is all about his East Bankers versus the millions of Palestinians who are refugees in the country. In fact, Hussein and the Hashemites, who are a very tiny ruling family, you can count them without running out of fingers and toes in contrast to the Saudis. The Hashemites stand above the East Bankers and the West Bankers. It's not as though the Hashemites have generations of history in the East Bank. Remember, they came from the Hejaz in what is now Saudi Arabia. They're recent arrivals. For them, they have to balance the interests of East Bankers and West Bankers between tra Palestinians and Transjordanians. And here, Israel plays a very important role in a number of respects. One, Israel is a state that actually has an interest in the survival of Jordan. There aren't any other states in the region who have an interest in the survival of the Hashemite kingdom. And point two, Israel has the key to the resolution of the internal Jordanian quandary between Palestinians and East Bankers. Namely, Israel holds the answer as to whether Palestinians will eventually someday find their national future west of the Jordan River or east of the Jordan River. If Israel lets Palestinians have a national future west of the Jordan River, that means the Hashemite future is secured east of the Jordan River. But if Israel prevents somehow Palestinians from having their national future west of the Jordan River, and Palestinians think that their only future can be where they have so many Palestinians who might have aspirations elsewhere, then the Hashemites are in trouble. This school of thought of Jordan as Palestine, meaning for our listeners, the Palestinian state is ultimately in Jordan, given the high number of Palestinians. To what extent did that school of thought in the Israeli right kind of hover over Jordan, and how did it have an impact in terms of Jordanian decision-making? The fear among Jordanians that Israel will resolve its Palestinian problem in Jordan is dominant. It pervades the thinking of East Bank Transjordanian elite, and it fixates the mind of uh, the Hashemite leadership. Israelis don't often utter the idea that they're conceiving of this, but Jordanians see in Israeli actions, whether it's certain settlement activity or certain retributions for actions that Palestinians may take, and they may see it even erroneously, but they still see it. It dominates their mind, dominates their thinking. It is the core fear that motivates Jordanians to act, sometimes to act to embrace Israel, to prevent this worst case, and sometimes to act to scream and worry and shry to the world, please stop the Israelis from doing something so disastrous, which is, for example, what the Jordanians feared with all the talk in recent months about a possible annexation within the West Bank. Rob Satloff, an astute observer of the Hashemite monarchy and, and of this country of Jordan for many decades, and a great colleague, I want to thank you very much for joining us. You're very welcome. Your Royal Highness, I can't thank you enough for being here in Amman and giving me the time to have this discussion with you really about the turning points, the big decision points on the road to peace. 87, 88 is a fascinating period yes. because you will even talk to Israeli officials and, and you will say, what was the biggest mistake you've made in 50 years 
they will often say the 1987 London agreement with King Hussein. And it was a fork in the road, so to speak. Well, I agree with you. It was a fork in the road. It was an administrative glitch of monumental dimensions. And we could only pick up after the London Agreement, which I think fell through for personal reasons, the chemistry of the Shamir Perez relationship being among them. I mean, after all, Perez came uh, over to Amman and uh, uh, met my brother in my house. I remember him being so flustered that when he left, he put his wig on back to front because he had been advised to wear a wig in the interest of uh, an incognito visitor. Was this the first time Shimon Peres had come to Amman? At least to my knowledge, right. anyway. So anyway, this is one of the sadnesses that um, foreign policy to succeed has to be representative of the leadership of the time. Yeah. If I had disagreed with my brother or others had uh, disagreed with him, he would not have been able to uh, successfully pursue a policy that would have led to some degree of consensus. And yet that is not enough. A warm peace has to be a peace in which all people are concerned and involved. Of course. The worst type of peace is a peace that is negotiated by emissaries, distinguished as uh, Shimon uh, was undoubtedly, who then have to go back and explain to their political leaders what it is they achieved and why they achieved it. Mm -hmm. The result is that, of course, on all sides, you feel you are negotiating with so many different groupings. Yeah. So the next key moment, it seems to me, of course, is the Madrid conference. But there's this shock in 93. I think for Jordan, who felt that it had this relationship, and the king, I don't know how long he knew Rabin personally, but they develop an extraordinary bond. They seem to see the Middle East almost exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. And yet, how does Rabin do this Oslo deal with the Palestinians and not tell Jordan? Anything that you could say about the relationship of your brother with Rabin that would give us an insight, I think would be very helpful. Well, you mentioned George Schultz a minute ago, and I just want to say that when he was speaking to Shimon Perez, uh, he um, had proposed, and it was a proposal known as the quality of life proposal, that the economic and social well-being of people in the territories or in the West Bank could be improved. And uh, rather than this, of course, the Palestinian people, after the uh, stumbling of Oslo, decided to go to the Antifada. So they degraded their own situation rather than uh, at least giving some life to their uh, identity in the territories. I think that Rabin felt that if you want to negotiate, you have to negotiate directly in terms of security concerns and uh, arrive at all three categories of security, whether basic security in terms of the recognition of borders, and our insistence, as my late brother used to put it, that the tripwire theory no longer stands, that soldiers coming from Syria or Iraq are our responsibility. We protect our outer perimeter. So I want to say that the basic security issue, the frontier that uh, the two of them worked out, King Hussein and Rabin, on that border, and I must say, that Ehud Barak at that particular time was extremely decisive in achieving this, was the first time that this frontier had been delineated. What is your recollection of that road to the treaty in 94? Well, uh, I just want to remind you that the safety net was composed of Eliakim Rubinstein, right. who headed the uh, open talks, right. of course, or in that sense represented the government of uh, Israel. Right. And that went back to the Madrid conference, for our listeners who yes. don't know all the yes. players, yes. Eliakim Rubinstein was uh, the cabinet secretary for Shamir at the time, and he held the chairmanship for the open channel that was both Israel and Jordanian and Palestinian. Yes, and then the combination of the legal representation and the intelligence representation, you mentioned uh, Ephraim more than once. Yeah was a small enough group, a manageable yeah. enough group, and of course I had the privilege of being with my brother on, on these occasions. 
So there were, there's this element of secrecy and expediency with Rubinstein and Halevi on the one side, yeah. whereas with the officially designated foreign minister and yeah. foreign office, yeah. of course, the foreign office of Israel and Shimon Peres was looking at all the different options at the same time. So I never knew whether I was talking the continuation of the bilateral Jordanian-Israeli negotiation or, as Vaslav Havel had it, when he talked to the Palestinians, he would ask me to join Perez. And I said, look, what's it got to do with me? He said, well, you know how to talk to both sides. So, I mean, I, I felt, uh, okay, well, I'm uh, you know, offering a role of some kind. Cultural affinity is extremely important. Exactly. And you were always able to convey that to the Israeli people. And to the last point, I remember the king coming to the Y River Agreement. He was sick, but it was a point of principle for him mm. to come to identify with the Y River effort. He goes to the White House mm. at the signing ceremony. Did he say to you, I, I, I feel I need to be there? Well, that was very clear. And when I saw him in London, I left my post, although I had spent uh, those weeks here in Jordan as his regent. And when I saw him, we have both had tears in our eyes and we repaired to his flat in London. And we spoke about putting the region in order, what needed to be done. And one of the very firm commitments, as far as my brother was concerned, is to remember that Jordan has five neighbors and that you simply cannot be in a situation of conflict with, with your five neighbors. You have to recognize what the role of a hub of peace that we should be exemplary to others. And I felt that uh, this is what he was trying to say when he came to Y River, that I am different in that sense. But of course, I think he was maybe like my grandfather, ahead of his time. And the sadness is that the groundwork to change people's attitudes had not developed in Jordan for a warm peace. I remember sitting with Rabin and my brother in Aqaba when this treaty had been signed. And the Israeli press said, what do you think of this? And I said, well, if you're talking about a peace between talking heads, it looks very good. But unless something is done in depth to realize all of these wonderful projects, tourists are not going to um, spend much time coming to visit if they feel a hostile atmosphere. If you were to just explain to people who didn't know your brother, to a young generation who didn't know him, how would you explain his attitude on peace well, I mean, to me, the difference is 13 years in, in, in age. He was my mentor, my king, and my role model. So in that sense, although I lost the company of my father, who died in the 70s, but I didn't see him effectively for many years because he was uh, ill in a clinic in right. Istanbul. Uh, my uh, brother's uh, definition of leadership was basically, I think, a compassionate leadership. I mean, that doesn't mean that the man was not firm in his decisions when uh, yeah. firmness was required. But it was a compassionate, benign soldier, if you will. He really felt this military backbone. We were, both went to the same public school in England, of course, was uh, very much a part of our formation as human beings. But uh, essentially, and particularly in later years, he became extremely dissatisfied with uh, the role of vested interest. He believed in the public good. And I think that was the great, the great motivational factor, that there was somebody you could trust. He generated trust. I just want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, it's Sarah Tuttle Singer from the Times of Israel. Come join our community and support fast and fair independent journalism. You can sign up with the link at the bottom of every single article on the site. I'm equally pleased to be joined by Ephraim Halevi, the former director of the Mossad, Israel's famed foreign service and the principal negotiator of the Israeli-Jordanian peace treaty. So, Maybe let's begin, if I'm to talk about the history and King Hussein's outreach. Coming as a young head of an Arab country to agree to secret contacts with Israel, there were real risks for him. What were the underlying forces that enabled him to reach out and sustain these quiet ties for decades before peace? We have to go back to the early 60s when uh, Hussein began uh, his uh, 
contacts with Israel. We then set up a radio link between Hussein and us. Unbeknown to me, I was chosen to be the person who read out the uh, Morse codes of messages that were sent to Hussein without knowing that Hussein was the recipient. Hussein himself was the person who received these messages and who decoded them. I do not know what the content of the messages were at the time. What I can say is that there was a parallel uh, relationship, which was uh, an inter-service relationship between us and the Brits. And the Brits used to pass messages from uh, us to Hussein through the channels of the British uh, intelligence service in the 60s. That was parallel to the ultimate physical relations which uh, were established when uh, Jacob Herzog met Hussein at a famous meeting in the uh, surgery of a Jewish doctor in London. What was that, 63? Was it Herbert Emanuel? Was that his name? Yes, yes, yes. And so you're saying that before the first meeting of 63, it started with a radio contact in 62. That's right. By the way, what I'm telling you now has never been published. That's uh, eye-popping. That was a famous story, right? On the eve of the 73 war, King Hussein, a week or two weeks before the war, that he warned that there was going to be a Syrian attack, and it was kind of implied that there would might be an Egyptian attack too. Yes. Now, parallel to that, Hussein passed on the message to the United States through the CIA, and I was then the station chief in Washington, and I was called in at the second day of the Rosh Hashanah. At the end of Rosh Hashanah, there was a party at the residence of one of the members of the embassy, and I was called out urgently. And I met the uh, CIA at night. I received a detailed report. It did not state what the source was, but when it reached Tel Aviv, people saw that this was exactly the message that Hussein had passed on orally by himself. So the king didn't want to risk that Israel would not get the signal, so he passed it through the United States as well. Exactly. And he also wanted to alert the United States that this is going to happen. Because there was a relationship, a very warm relationship between Hussein and the United States in general and the CIA in particular. Wow, that's amazing. That's the first I've heard of that. Why do you think he did it? I think his motive was, A, possibly to warn us in time. And uh, maybe the Israel would start taking steps in order to make it clear to the other side that we were aware of what was going to happen. And might be in this way, the war would be averted. And secondly, if we were warned, there was a greater chance that in the end, we would have the upper hand. And then another key moment happens on the eve of the Gulf War, when Israel is concerned that Saddam Hussein is going to attack Israel with Scud missiles, could be with chemicals, as he threatened to do. And clearly, the United States wanted Israel to stay out in order to um, avoid fracturing the anti-Saddam coalition led by Washington. In August, when the uh, crisis began in the Gulf, when Iraq invaded Kuwait, Hussein allowed the Iraqis to send their aircraft on reconnaissance flights, which were south of the Dead Sea, which in terms of distance were not very distant from a place called Dimona. And this was a matter of enormous concern. And I was asked to uh, meet with Hussein. And I met with Hussein. And I met him on the day that he had a meeting with Margaret Thatcher in the morning. I met him in the afternoon. And I spoke to him at length on the situation. And I more or less issued a warning to him that if he didn't remove these Iraqi aircraft, there would be extreme trouble. And he said to me, you know, uh, what you're telling me is very grave. You're saying it so nicely to me. It's much more pleasant than to talk to Margaret Thatcher, which I'm not sure was a great compliment, but at any rate, that's what he said. I then said to him, Your Majesty, I think the situation is such that nobody really knows what's going to happen. And therefore, I strongly suggest that you have a secret meeting with Shamir, who's the Prime Minister, before things happen. And he said to me, Do you think that Shamir will agree to uh, see me? So I said to him, I think that if you agree, he will agree. I had no authority from Shamir to say this. I came back home and I reported, and I said to Shamir that I think it was important for him to meet with Hussein. And Shamir said to me, do you think he will see me? And I said, if you are willing to see him, you have a meeting. 
So a meeting took place in January 1991 in London. It was a secret meeting. Shamir came with Ehud Barak, who was then Deputy Chief of Staff, and with his two political figures, Rubinstein and Ben Aaron. And they discussed the situation and the possibility of what would happen if there'd be a war. And at one moment, Hussein said to the Prime Minister, let's talk alone. And uh, they went into a next room, and with, two minutes later, they came out and they called me in, and they said to the others, he is our trusted envoy. He has the complete trust of both of us. And from that moment on, I became the person who was always called our uh, trusted representative, or our trusted envoy. At this meeting, Shamir demanded the right to overfly Jordan if it would be necessary to attack uh, missile sites. He didn't know then that there would be a missile attack, but he thought there might, might be. And uh, Hussein refused. He said, I cannot allow you to overfly my territory. If you can do onto something in the tr- stratosphere, that's something else. He said, I will have to shoot you down. Shamir said, if you do that, we will have to destroy your army. He said, well, if that is what uh, Providence decides, uh, that is, will be it. And that was the end of the meeting. But the meeting did not end in acrimony. It ended in a way which Hussein could understand that he had made his point. And if you remember, what happened was that when the uh, war between uh, the United States and the coalition took place, they did attack Israel with missiles, 39 missiles, if you remember. There was enormous pressure in Israel to retaliate. And the president said, I think, uh, sent Eagleberger, who was then uh, Deputy Secretary of State, to sit in Jerusalem and be a kind of a babysitter to hold Shamir's hand that he should not attack. There was no real uh, danger that he would attack because he always constantly, at least on two occasions, called me in and said, please report Pete to me exactly what I said to him and he said to me. And I did that. And after this happened, he said to me, you know, I want you to know that if this had happened, this would have been the end of the Kingdom of Jordan. And I have only to thank Shamir for taking this decision. And I want to thank you for bringing this all about. The two of you are those who saved the Kingdom of Jordan from destruction. This is what King Hussein said to you. Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing story. What happened was that I uh, traveled with Paris on the 2nd of November to Amman, 2nd of November, I think it was, in 1993. It was at the home of Prince Hassan, and they met there, and then a few minutes uh, after the meeting began, Peres asked to see the king privately, which was against what uh, Rabin had decided, and he spoke to the king for about half an hour, and he came out and said, everything is settled, we have a peace treaty. And he was in uh, an exhilarating mood, because actually this was not what had agreed in the bigger forum it was agreed that there would be further talks six weeks from now from this meeting to discuss various details, various ideas that came up. There was no agreement on peace. But at any rate, that is what Paris said to me. Three weeks later, in December, I uh, received an urgent request from Ali Shikri to come and see the king at once. The king told me that a short while before, he had received a letter from the President of the United States saying that uh, he was very glad to hear the king had agreed to sign a peace treaty with Israel, and that since he knew that the king was going to visit uh, the United States in January for treatment, he was already then known to have cancer, and he came from time to time for treatment in the United States, maybe in January it would be the right time to get a peace treaty signed in Washington. The king was furious because he had not agreed to this, and he wrote back to the president, and I'll read you part of the letter he said he wrote to uh, President Clinton, and I quote, The drive to achieve final results in the peace process by January 1994 is an ambitious goal indeed. While we in Jordan are sparing no effort to arrive at a state of peace as soon as can be, we are doubtful that such an objective is attainable in two months. The smoothness of negotiations on the Jordanian-Israeli track cannot obviate the fact that many agenda items are still in their early stage of discussion, and their satisfactory resolution requires intensive and detailed deliberations. An early signature of a treaty before the subjects agreed to in the agenda have had a chance to be thoroughly discussed will not only be too ambitious, but may be harmful to the cause of peace to which we are committed. You can well understand uh, the situation that had uh, arisen there. Yeah. Also, if I remember at the time, Paris had done a, an interview 
on Israel television, and he said to journalists afterwards, remember the 3rd of November. And that became a headline. Remember the 3rd of November. And that be quickly became a sense that, that this was going to leak. And apparently both the king and, and Rabin were furious. That is true. And it was a, a especially sensitive period because five days from then there was going to have a general election in Jordan and the Muslim Brotherhood was going to participate in the elections. So it was the worst possible time that this could have happened. Now the question arose what to do about all this and met with uh, King Prince Hassan and others. And I told them, look, if I return and I report all this to uh, Rabin uh, as it is, and Paris will come and say that it's uh, all a lie, it's his word against mine. And in this situation with his word against mine, uh, Rabin could not afford to say I accept uh, Ephraim's version. And the only way that I can deal with this is if you give me the documentation, both the letter you received from the president and the reply you sent. And he thought about it. He said, okay, I got the letters and I came back and I saw uh, Rabin. I will not describe the drama in the room. But the end was that Rabin said that as of that on, Paris should not be informed about anything going on and that he would determine who would be the people who would be uh, privy to what is happening, as the people who were close to him and myself and, of course, Shabtai Shavit, who's head of the Mossad. So from that time on, I was the only person who was meeting uh, the king. My meeting with him was delayed until April of 1994. At the end of the visit, the king said to me, I've decided to move ahead. So until April 1994, it wasn't clear to you that there would be a treaty? No. This was the eve of, uh, of Israel Independence Day that day. And I came back, and the following morning, there were two terrorist attacks at against two bus stations in Qadera and Afula, and the Israel was in a, in a state of mourning, and there was a high uh, tension in Israel, and uh, I decided, in brackets, mistakenly, I think, not to ask to see Rabin on this uh, background and wait till after the Independence Day. And then, of course, tension arose, and people said that the uh, perpetrators had come from Jordan, and there was a uh, big effort to uh, get an anti-Jordan atmosphere. And talk was of maybe war would break up between Israel and Jordan. All that I had done and all that had been done there was on hold. Rabin uh, called me in the afternoon and said that he wanted me to inform uh, the king that he was uh, very angry about what was happening and about the attacks. And I said, look, I want to... Uh, I report to you something. I've just come back from Jordan. I've been something important to tell me. He said, for once, do exactly what you're told. And he said, I want you to send a message to King Hussein that the situation is deteriorating and we might have to take action. A few hours later, uh, on the uh, roof of the Ministry of Defense, after a uh, Independence Day uh, celebration had taken place, a, a uh, meeting with uh, all the uh, hierarchy of Israel who were invited uh, to a kind of a garden party there. He and uh, Paris held a press conference together, lambasted uh, Hussein and Jordan. The following day, I saw Rabin and told him the whole story of what had happened and that the king was now going forward and so on and so forth. And he looked at me uh, with a stern face and said, why didn't you tell me? So I said, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you know yourself why I didn't tell you. We were on the verge of total collapse once again, and somehow the uh, situation was uh, restored. I just want to know, what do you think drove the process? He knew that uh, Israel was negotiating with Syria at the time. He once told me, he made a cryptic remark, which I registered and told Rabbi, that he had intimated to uh, Hafez Assad that he was uh, going to take this path and the Khafas Assad had given his blessing to this. That was a very important element in my view. Don't forget that Assad was negotiating with Israel at the time, and this negotiation was a serious one. And if Rabin had not been assassinated, we would have had a peace treaty with Syria. You definitely had a personal relationship with the king. And, and can you say, what is it you learned about him? You know, what spoke to him? in terms of how he saw his role as a leader in terms of peace? I think all that was genuine. 
I think it was genuine and it was truthful and it was uh, in line with the Hashemite tradition, I think. Don't forget that his grandfather had also uh, been in touch with us. Uh, there is something very deep in this. Well, it certainly have been a force for stability, these ties between I agree. Israel and Jordan. So I just want to thank you so much for your time in uh, really opening our eyes to an amazing road that uh, I don't think anyone has ever heard before. So I just really want to thank you very, very much. Thank you. All the best to you. We just heard a fascinating set of remarks of two people who knew Jordan's King Hussein extremely well. King Hussein was ahead of his time. He started dealing with Israel quietly in the early 1960s. His relationship with Yitzhak Rabin was legendary. I will never forget watching King Hussein's eulogy at Rabin's funeral. I was the ABC News commentator at the time, and I just remember how moved I was when Hussein hailed Rabin, saying he was, quote, grieving the loss of a brother, a colleague, and a friend, end quote. We're calling to what he called, quote, the camp of peace, end quote, and the role of Rabin. King Hussein said, quote, this is where we stand. This is our camp, end quote. He indicated he saw it as his responsibility to carry forth the legacy of his friend and brother. He often publicly invoked the responsibility to bring together, quote, all of the children of Abraham. His legacy remained strong under the leadership of his son, King Abdullah II. Over a quarter century after the peace treaty, Jordan remains committed to political moderation at home and close security ties with the United States, Israel, and pragmatic Arab states. Given his enduring influence, people in the Mideast and beyond are not likely to forget the path of Jordan's King Hussein bin Talal. Thank you all very much for listening. Please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe, rate, and review Decision Points. And please tell your friends. I've also recently published a book co-authored with Ambassador Dennis Ross on four key Israeli leaders called Be Strong and of Good Courage, How Israel's Most Important Leaders Shaped Its Destiny. I want to thank all of those who made this podcast possible. Our coordinator, Basha Rosenbaum, a researcher, Scott Boxer, Jeff Rubin, Scott Rogers, and Carolina Krauskopf of the Washington Institute, Richard Myron and Anouk Millet of Earshot Strategies, and Paul Woody Woodhull of District Productive. Thank you all. Thank you.